Tesla AI announced all cars produced at Giga Texas are now using FSD unsupervised. Yes, unsupervised to deliver cars from the end of line to the logistics lot. Over 50,000 driverless miles already, and they dropped several videos to show this off. Yeah, we'll get there. First, we'll start for some news that came out just this morning. Uh, it looks like that Elon here for the said this for the first time, there will soon be a generalized pure AI solution to full self-driving, just cameras and a Tesla AI chip with Tesla AI software. Uh, this weekend, Tesla AI dropped three videos showing that in Giga Texas, when they make a car there, a Model Y or a Cybertruck, it now uses what they're calling FSD unsupervised to deliver cars from the end of line to the outbound logistics lot. They're saying now that over 50,000 driverless miles have been accrued between California and Texas factories so far. We'll watch that video. And also they showed Model Y's autonomously navigating a 1.4 mil mile trip on a road shared with pedestrians, cars, semi-trucks, construction equipment, and more. Let's take a look at what that looks like here. I'll take the music out. What do you think about this uh, video, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, this is, this to me, this is Tesla taking those necessary steps to gain confidence. And, you know, this is really showing that you're taking, you know, the asset at the end of the manufacturing line it has peak value add to it. it the, the car does not get more yeah. expensive to repair at this point in the time in the manufacturing process. So to have this kind of confidence, which they should, quite frankly, if we're going to unsupervised in a couple of months and we're, you know, it's driving people today. To me, this is just adding, this is how Tesla AI st starts entering the factory. Tesla, Tesla AI is entering the, the back of the factory and and it's going to make its way into you know the the you know or you know deeper into the factory uh and start really uh helping out in in a, in a number of different areas to really inform you know what's going on in the manufacturing process but this is this is automating the manufacturing process with you know with cameras and and with tesla's ai chip and software that's already inside of the vehicle today so no external apparatuses needed, no additional capex, removing labor out of the operation. So, I mean, we've talked about this, the fact that they've been able to expand it so rapidly, put it on all the vehicles, uh, tells you how quickly that they can, you know, they can use this in, to, to gain productivity. It's great. Yeah. I think when they called it FSE unsupervised, right, that is mm -hmm. a new term. That means that these cars might, and very likely if they called it that, is installed with FSC unsupervised instead of FSC version 13, you know, beta or supervised. That's what it could be. So that means that uh, it could mean that we're about to get FSC unsupervised. And you can see here, these are shared roads, public. Uh, well, maybe not public, but shared roads. And it's 1.4 mile trip. So, you know, it's not just this, you know, yeah. contained area that right that you know they're pretty comfortable with they know it's got everything it needs to have yeah and then this is well that's that and then you've got um not only the model y and what that's a 1.4 mile trip but you got the cyber truck now they're going through a different route uh, 1.6 miles traversing between beneath one of america's fastest highways emerging through a steep 17 percent grade to reach their dest destination that music out. Yeah, the Cybertruck goes through a different thing with a with a tunnel. Some people are saying that it's actually harder to go through a tunnel than it is uh, just normal roads. I don't know if you know anything about that. I'm sorry, Herbert. I you cut off for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Some people think that it's harder to go through a tunnel than just normal roads. Um, I I'm not sure uh, in in yeah. terms of that being more difficult or not. I just from a factory perspective, this is this is amazing. I, there's no other product in the world that basically puts itself on the shelf. Uh, this is essentially, you know, <laughs> yeah. during you know, during the manufacturing process. Okay, I'm done. Let me go put myself on the shelf so I'm ready for distribution. There's nothing like it. And you know, the only next step, you know, from here is these cars just leaving, you know, being purchased online and then just turning themselves on and driving to the owners. Right. So w when does that start happening? That's that's a logical next step as well from Tesla's various uh, delivery centers. 
Okay, let's get to the tariffs. Uh, this is a, very, a lot of big things happened this weekend. Elon replied a couple times, so we'll take a look at what he's saying here. But first, um, you've got, oh, here we go. Remove this, put this up here. So here's the full list of items. Okay, President Trump exempted uh, from his the new reciprocal tariffs. And then here is this list that you provided. It's quite uh, lengthy, of course, but the exempted smartphones. Thank you. I'm sure Apple lobbied for that. Computers, uh, computer parts, monitors, semiconductors. That's a big deal. We'll talk about that. Flat panel displays and so forth. What do you think about this list? Well, let's let's explain what happened. So there's a series of escalations over the past week going back and forth. Um, really awful n negotiating tactics on on both sides. Nobody engaging in a conversation. Just you know, just pure escalation back and forth. And we ended up with somewhere between eighty four and one hundred and four percent. You know, inbound to China, then inbound to the U.S. up to one hundred and forty five percent. And what the president and his team did here was to exempt certain product families from the 145% stack tariff. But if you destack that tariff, there's uh, Section 301, there's Section 232 sector tariffs in there, there's fentanyl tariffs in there. So when you destack everything, those things on that list are still getting a 20% tariff uh, inbound. That is a staggering tariff level uh, to put on those products. So, and I, I, I put a post out early in the weekend, Saturday morning, and soon as I saw the ex exemptions and I just said, I, I don't know if I want to get into a long post and a set of exchanges on this, but I knew that these residual tariffs were still on and that they're still just staggering. The 145% was literally a, an instantaneous trade embargo. Like nobody's going to import stuff. Things are just going to stop. And, and that's all that was. And that's why I, mm -hmm. I posted about that. It's, it's, it's basically a trade embargo. Uh, when mm -hmm. you start putting product up at, at the, when you want make it a thousand percent, it, bringing it down to, to, to 20%. I, so we'll, we'll, let, let's just step into it. So when we were at 145 in the mineral restrictions, I said, look, this is essentially a trade embargo. This is a disaster. It's absolute unmitigated disaster. And, and, and really want to, this is the thing we used to do with my teams. And just in spite, when we, when we had an issue and we were trying to assess the severity of it, we wanted to look at, okay, well, how often or how quickly is information changing? Is this something that we're going to talk about? you know, every, you know, every six hours, every 12 hours, when are we, when are we getting on the phone to go through the issues? And if they were that serious, we were getting up in the middle of the night, uh, every, every few hours. And we were getting a quick status up depending on what time zone we were in on these tariff issues. I, I mean, I think the negotiations should be measured in hours and minutes in terms of how we're managing these situations. Cause what's happening right now in reality, and this is part of the problem. Part of the problem is, is that the real operators in these situations, they're in a bad position. They cannot go on TV. They cannot go public in terms of what's happening because then they're giving up negotiating leverage with whomever they're negotiating with on the other side to do business in the tariff environment. So they can't do that. They can't upset their local host government by speaking out against the local host government, whether it's a U.S. company speaking out about the U.S., a U.S. company speaking out about China, and then vice versa. They can't do that. So they're in a bad position. But the reality on the ground is between these tariffs that are still on, remember, there's still 20% tariffs that are still on. There's still sector tariffs that are still on, autos, steel, um, auto parts, ex-USMCA, uh, lumber. There's still all these sector tariffs on. There's still out of China, there's a 20% fentanyl tariff that's still on. I, people posting on my account of like, well, don't you care about fentanyl? I care about all of it. The question is, is how do you manage it to get effective results? So you get, you get the desired results of what, I mean, make it a thousand percent. My point is just make it a thousand percent. Uh, if you want to do that, the, 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 the 20 tariffs over 20% uh, it destroys several categories of products that you can't make them. Uh, and, and in, I don't know, I don't know who that is helping 
in terms of, okay, for example, a 20% tariff on, on smartphones coming in, for example, that's going to blow out the budget series of smartphones. So think about all the different, that's a lot, it's many tens of millions of phones that are sold in the U S are, are pay as you go or entry series phones. That's where most of the volume is. Then you step up to the mid tier uh, devices and, and those also have very low gross margins from a manufacturing perspective as well. If you tack on a 20% tariff, which basically is this thing comes in, I got to take the transfer value of that product and I have to give 20% more to the host government that's where I'm importing. You know, that's where they get blown away. And people say, well, they're just going to pass along to the consumer. That consumer is very sensitive from a cost perspective. So every situation is going to be different. And so when people say like, well, tariffs are a tax on the consumer, well, no, they're, they're all the above. They, they, sometimes they hit the consumer. Sometimes they're a tax on the company that's making the product or importing it, the importer of record. And then sometimes it's a tax on the exporting company and it causes um, uptime utilization issues back home. So this is causing problems in China. There's no question about it. But the question is, is the, what, what, what's the right tariff level? How to apply it? And, and how would you, you know, how would you go about solving this problem? And I keep coming back to, down to understand what you can make today at time equals zero and understand what the schedule is to bring up that capability in the U S and be competitive. And if you have the capability in the U S and you can be competitive, you should tariff it. If, if, if we're going to be able to bring down other trade barriers and get more competitive, more open, open trade, and we are being mistreated, which we are, there's no question about it. So there's no question in my mind that there's a problem to solve here. It's more of the execution and how it's being managed. And the specific issue is tariffing things that we don't know how to make. As soon as you don't know how to, as soon as you tariff something you don't have to, you don't know how to make, you convert that into basically a tax and you either have the capacity to pay the tax or you just don't buy as much of that product or you shut the product line down. Uh, and, 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 that, the, and that's the situation we're in now. And I even heard the, the president, you know, as we're, uh, recording this this morning, uh, talk about now there's some relief coming for, for autos. Of course, there's going to be relief coming for autos. This is a disaster, uh, for us automakers. This is an absolute disaster for you, uh, for us automakers, because first off, many of their models now cost 25% more to import. And you can say, well, yeah, don't move all your final assembly out of the U S got it. This is something that took Tesla a decade to engineer, to figure out how to and build the supply chain and build the engineering capability to make a vehicle profitably in the U S and right now, if you're a U.S. car manufacturer, if you're a Stellantis or a GM and about half of your vehicles or more are imported. And then the content of the vehicles that you actually final assemble in the U S probably have less than 50% content that was made in the U S that's all getting, that's all getting tariffed unless it's, it was a USMCA assembly. It's getting tariffed. They're getting a lot of parts out of, out of Asia coming into those products. So it looks like from what I'm hearing this morning, there may be some, some relief coming on autos. We'll see what happens later in the day, but essentially what we started, what, what happened in the last week, escalation, escalation, no conversation. You could have made the tariffs a thousand percent. It wouldn't matter. The big thing we haven't talked about, we need to get into next are the rare earths and what yeah. this means to products. I'll pause here for a minute. No, thank you so much, Jeff. I mean, this is, uh, you, I know that you're getting phone calls from top level executives and you're saying that they can't speak out, but uh, it's important that somebody with actual experience say something because, you know, regular people like me think, oh, they took away the 145%. Great. Now everything's good. <laughs> it's not. There are certain com uh, products that are, that are being devastated at this point. So that's fine. Um, you know, hopefully they will resolve this, but every day that goes by, it's going to be a real issue. 